This year, I've purchased an iPhone 17 Pro and iPhone Air to disassemble, compare and assess their repairability. Over the last five years, there's been a dramatic change in the repairability of the iPhone. The 12 was the model that sparked a lot of controversy over repair. Not because it was the first to be programmed to reject replacement parts, but because these anti-repair practices became well known, shown in my original video. Every year since, I've purchased two of each iPhone model to see what's changed. Apple having to comply with new laws. Last year's iPhones allowed parts from two brand new and identical iPhones to work, after running Apple's online calibration tool. The use of third-party parts has improved also, with things like third-party batteries once again displaying battery health. Although the full compatibility of third-party parts is debated, they're not eligible for Apple's parts pairing tool, and even some used genuine parts are facing issues. So unlike my previous teardown and repair assessment videos, there was no longer a need for two identical phones, as that will no longer tell us the compatibility of third-party parts. So instead, we'll take a look inside the new iPhone Air and iPhone 17 Pro, see what the size of that iPhone Air battery really is, because Apple hasn't made it public as well as the physical repairability of both devices and Apple's new Plateau camera bump, which is supposedly housing more than just the cameras. I'll get both phones unpacked in preparation for our teardown. Included with the Pro model is a USB-C cable and SIM eject tool. For the Air, you'll only get the cable and a piece of paper stating you'll no longer need a physical SIM card. Because the air is so thin, Apple has chosen to remove the SIM tray on all iPhone Air models worldwide. I don't have an eSIM, nor does my carrier support it, so this is just an expensive iPod Touch for me. The Pro still has a SIM tray, at least in my region. North American phones are not so lucky. The Air makes the Pro model feel like a real brick, almost if these phones are several years apart. But to achieve that 5.6mm thickness, the Air has sacrificed more than just the SIM tray. Its battery is smaller, but Apple won't say how much, only stating it's a whole day's worth of battery. So I plan to see the actual capacity of these phones, and just what Apple had to shrink down or cut out to make this phone so thin. I'll start by heating up the back of the phone, thus creating hot air. After 5 minutes, the air is nice and toasty, so I can apply a suction cup and lift up the back glass, just enough to insert a plastic pick. Using the pick, I can cut through the adhesive and unlatch the several clips securing this back panel in place. The strength of the adhesive was bearable, and softened quite well with heat. Lifting up the back panel, we have our first look inside the new iPhone Air. But before we get too excited, I think we should open up the 17 Pro. I believe it will be interesting to see in its own merit, containing Apple's best performing phone hardware, including a new vapor chamber. After its round on the heat plate and the two pentalobe security screws from the bottom have been removed, we can begin opening it up. The 17 Pro didn't open up as easily as the Air, having to be returned to the heat plate two further times. Eventually, I cranked it up to the high setting to really get some heat into the phone. But after working my pick between the display and frame, the opening procedure is the same as what we've just completed with the Air, although I found this adhesive to be far stronger. Lifting the display to the left hand side, we can see the redesigned internals. Immediately, we can see the Pro and Air models are vastly different. Not only do they open from opposite sides, the Pro appears to be covered in a new bracket spanning a large portion of the device and the Air's battery is enclosed in a metal case. The 17 Pro also features a new type of screw, Torx. Granted, it's not a security version, it adds to the amount of screwdrivers you'll need to repair this device, which includes Pentalobe, Tri-Wing, Torx, Phillips, and Standoff. The Air, however, lacks any Torx screws. Immediately, I can see the Air is missing a typical component, usually found at the bottom with the charge port. Can you spot what it is? Having a closer look at the Pro, this large bracket is covered in graphite, which clues us into what it is. This is the new vapor chamber. It's held in with 13 Torx screws. To remove it, we first need to detach the display, which for the first time in over 10 years, Apple has used Phillips screws to secure the brackets rather than Tri-Wing. 
I'll get the battery unplugged before detaching the display's two flex cables, the smaller of which looks to be very fragile. Next, we can remove all those torque screws to free the vapour chamber. Articles online suggest the return to aluminium from titanium was so that the heat from the vapour chamber could be better dissipated through the frame, but we'll have to judge that for ourselves. All these torque screws had been secured very firmly. Likely, this plate also gives structural rigidity to this phone. Lifting up the vapour chamber, do you see what I see? Once we get it removed, I think you'll see what I see. There's no battery. Because it's stuck to the vapour chamber, which means it's technically screwed in. As we want to see the vapour chamber, I'll remove the battery from this metal bracket. While it might look like a pull tab, it isn't. Removal is similar to last year's iPhone models. A power supply of around 9 to 12 volts needs to be attached and left for a few minutes for the adhesive to break its bond. I had to take a bit of an educated guess as to where I needed to attach the wires. Apple usually mentions this in their repair manuals, however they have yet to be released for the 17 series phones. Once it had reached 0.1 of a volt, the battery's adhesive had deactivated and the battery could be just lifted free. That leaves us with an uninterrupted look at the vapour chamber. The vapour chamber doesn't directly attach to the CPU with any kind of thermal paste, which is odd. There is a black pad, although it doesn't look like any thermal pad I've seen before. The CPU is also hidden behind more graphite, so I'm not sure how efficiently this would work. As to me, it seems like the battery would be making better thermal contact with it than the CPU is. Speaking of batteries, it's time we found out what the size of the battery in the iPhone Air really is. Is it anywhere near as large as the one in the Pro? With the back panel removed, we can see how some of the components sit proud of the frame, being housed in the camera bump. It seems the Air wasn't fortunate enough to get all Phillips screws on the battery or back panel bracket, like the Pro did. Once the battery is unplugged, we can work on removing it in a similar way to the Pro. I connected the two adhesive strips together with the battery, however I now believe you need to do one at a time, connecting one side of the battery to the frame, as the method I did here only unadhered one section of adhesive. The display's fragile flex cable is exposed beneath the lower section of the battery, so avoid prying in this area. We have the air battery in hand, its size 12.26 watt hours, with the Pro version rated at 15.53. Surprisingly, the Air's rated battery capacity isn't all that much smaller. I was expecting a larger difference. The footprint of the Air's battery is larger, but it's only 3mm thick compared to the 5.3mm of the Pro battery. The connectors are different, but the same iPhone Air battery can be found in the MagSafe battery pack. Next, we'll work on getting the motherboard and cameras out of these phones. In Apple's usual fashion, there's a lot of brackets, flex cables, and screws of varying length to keep track of. I was hoping to be able to remove the logic board first, however this is not possible. Not only is one of the camera's flex cables in the way, but there's also two additional cables located under the earpiece speaker and camera assembly that need to be detached before the logic board can be removed. For the past 8 years, iPhone cameras have been getting progressively larger. This is the largest yet. Here it is in comparison to an iPhone 11 Pro, the first Pro model iPhone. As we've not yet attempted to remove the back glass panel, there's a flex cable for it located under the board. Folding it to one side, its bracket can be unfastened and its cable unplugged. With that, our logic board is free. In what Apple calls the plateau is the LED flash, a microphone and antenna hardware. With the Pro's logic board out, it's time for the air. Learning from my experiences with the Pro, I'll start with the camera. Although, even after its screws are removed, it's not coming out. I'll remove the Face ID hardware so I can have a look at what's preventing it from detaching. Apple has chosen to adhere this microphone cable to the back of the camera, requiring delicate prying to separate. With the camera out, I'll continue working on the logic board removal. I don't usually say this, but if you're enjoying watching me take apart these new iPhones, consider subscribing. I'm only 17,000 off a million. If not for the support I've received for these videos over the years, 
these teardowns wouldn't have been possible. So thank you to everyone who has been with me all these years. Like the Pro, this Air also has cables underneath its logic board. These two are for the display, of which can be removed separately from the frame like previous iPhone models, allowing for straightforward display and back glass replacements. With the logic board free, we can see just how thin they managed to get it. The Air and Pro I have here both have an Apple A19 Pro, 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. I don't know where they fit it all on the Air, but it's impressive. The board does increase in thickness at the top, just like the phone. And when assembled, the larger section is nestled away in the camera plateau. Both Face ID modules house the same cameras, but have different cables to fit each model. For the rear cameras, the Air lacks a telephoto and wide-angle camera. Down at the lower section of the Pro, you'll find a SIM tray, speaker, two microphones, the Taptic engine, a USB-C charge port, and various antennas, one of which makes contact to the glass back panel. On the Air, things are a bit different. Firstly, there's no SIM tray on this model at all, but there's also no speaker. The earpiece speaker is on double duty to save space. The USB-C port hardware has also been slimmed down quite a bit to fit in such a thin housing. Almost everything has been slimmed down in some way to fit. This can make working on this phone more fragile than ever. Just a slip of my spudger was enough to snap this 0.1mm cable clean off. This being my fifth year of teardowns, this is the first iPhone out of the 12 or so I've purchased that I've damaged something on. I'm just thankful it wasn't a $900 screen cable, but the Taptic Engine, Apple's fancy name for a vibrator. It's probably going to be a $30 part, so not an expensive fix. But what we've learned is a vital bit of iPhone Air repair advice. Unplug the leftmost cable first, because the cable next to it has the ability to tear it in half if bent backwards. The screen is removable from the frame with a removal procedure identical to the Pro model and many previous iPhone models. So for that reason, I'll leave it in place. Despite how thin this phone is, the display and back panel can be replaced independently. Access to the battery and other internals can be achieved by just removing the back glass, thus avoiding any risk to the expensive OLED display. The last thing left to remove on the Pro is the back glass. Thankfully, Apple hasn't returned to their concrete-like glue from some old glass-backed phones. The panel can be replaced on its own without removing the front display and is attached using adhesive much weaker than the front display, which I can't understand as the excuse for strong adhesive has always been for water resistance. Based on my experience, the adhesive holding the glass section in place was far easier to remove. Attached to it is the wireless charging coil and MagSafe magnets. With that, we've now completely disassembled the iPhone Air and iPhone 17 Pro. The Pro model has gained a vapor chamber, lots of extra torque screws, bigger cameras, a battery that can be removed with screws, and a small glass panel that can be easily replaced. However, the redesign has foregone the ability to replace the battery without having to remove the display. The Air, Apple's new ultra-thin phone, is remarkably jam-packed. The battery is larger than I expected and can be removed with electricity, but watch out for that Taptic engine cable connecting to the charge port. It breaks easy. Now, it's just the case of getting these phones back together. If you were to replace any of the major components like the display, battery, cameras or back panel, iOS will detect the change and notify you in settings. Some parts will allow for calibration and others may run at a reduced capacity or with warning messages about the replacement parts being unknown. I did a dedicated video on this and how the new system works. For more information on this, please check out that video. With the 17 Pro back together, all that's left is the iPhone Air. I will have to open both of these phones back up to apply some new adhesive when it becomes available on the market. I'll also need to install a new Taptic engine into this iPhone Air to bring it back into a fully functional state. Once the back panel has been attached, I can clean off the insides of the iPhone before closing up the back panel. Finally, I can install the two pentalobe screws and we're done. So this is it. The iPhone Air and 17 Pro have survived the teardown and repair assessment. 
Despite their great modularity of parts, Apple is still in full control of what replacement parts they approve for the use of an online calibration tool. While Apple unlocked this tool starting with iOS 18, supporting the iPhone 12 or later, there's still no telling if the terms of the service will change or it'll go offline in five years time. But for a change, I'm pleasantly surprised with this year's iPhone models. Let me know what you thought. And if you're looking to buy or sell a used phone, test it with my app iTest. Easily test major hardware functions from the basics, like the touchscreen, to things not always easy to test, like screen burn-in, the gyroscope, and compass. The Android version also supports testing for voice over LTE to prepare for 3G shutdowns worldwide, and spoofed hardware info, common on cheap no-name phones. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the Teardown and Repair Assessment playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.